everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. I am a little rusty. I've been off work for seven months, um, so bear with me. Um, today I'm here to talk about domestic human trafficking, and I'll talk about what the word domestic means. I hope that you, you know, that this can be as informal as you'd like it to be, that you ask questions, that you interrupt at any time, that you, uh, if there's a slide that, you know, that you're hoping there would be a slide on and there isn't one, that you bring it up, that you challenge me, um, that you walk away having a better understanding of what this actually looks like in, in Ontario and in, in our city. Does that sound okay? Okay. Um, I am, I work at East Metro Youth Services when I, when I am working, which is an adolescent mental health center, so I do specialize in youth, but I think a lot of the information that I'll be presenting today can be applied to the population that you support. Um, but I am not an expert in developmental services at all, so I really hope that you take this information and you continue to apply it to the population because you are the experts in the room, not me. Does that sound okay? Okay. So, how many people have seen the movie Take It? Raise your hand. Okay, so what happens in that movie? Does anyone remember? It's like this, this dramatization with, with Liam Neeson, his daughter gets trafficked. Ring a bell, right? So she goes, she, she meets these suave, lovely men at the airport, um, and then, you know, they sort of swoon her, and then later she goes back to the hotel where she's staying. She hears somebody breaking into this place. She physically hides under the bed, and this person forcibly removes her from under, under the bed, takes her out of the hotel or wherever she's staying, and he brings her to a different country where she is then trafficked, right? This is a very common misconception of how trafficking is portrayed. So every way that that movie portrays human trafficking is really the opposite of what it actually looks like in an Ontario context. So the first thing that we need to know is the definition of uh, human trafficking. And we also really need to cha challenge our notions of, of what we think it is, because we've seen these movies, we've seen the takens, we've seen the news story, we've seen, you know, we've heard a story on the radio, we've read that article, and our idea of what human trafficking is is very different than what it actually is. So how do we, we have to reflect on how we actually understand human trafficking to be and be open to being challenged. And because this is such a, uh, you know, the topic that is incredibly difficult to hear about, a topic that a lot of people have really strong moral and value-based opinions on, we have to be aware of our own opinion. We have to be aware of how that might impact uh, if somebody was to make a disclosure to us or if we were to find out that a client that we were supporting was involved in this, what would they get from us? that we might not know we're giving off because we have these preconceived notions of what human trafficking actually is. Does that make sense? So you don't have to answer these questions out loud, but think about them. Think about how your opinion of this topic, you know, last night you knew you were coming to a training on human trafficking, so w what was going on in your mind? What did you think it was going to be covered today? And how might that opinion impact a client you are, are supporting. Okay, so let's break down what human trafficking actually is. Can, if I keep moving like this, does that work for everyone or do you want me to stay put? It's okay? Okay. Um, so there are basically, if you break down like the cheating definition of what human trafficking is, there are three elements. Force, fraud, and coercion facilitated by a third party. That's, that's really all you need to know definition-wise of what human trafficking is. Force, fraud, and coercion facilitated by a third party. Often we think that borders need to be crossed, like this, the, the movie Taken, right? She's brought to a different country, or that movement needs to take place. This is sometimes an element that is present in human trafficking, but it is 100% unnecessary in order for human trafficking to exist. You can be from Bathurst and Lawrence and be trafficked at Bathurst and Lawrence. You can be from Scarborough and be trafficked in Scarborough. Zero movement is necessary. 
really important because that's so that's a very common uh, misconception. Now, we also sometimes believe that all sex work is inherently human trafficking, that all sex work is inherently exploitive. Now, I like to think of it as something called the three C's, choice, circumstance, and coercion. And I think of them on a spectrum. So I think of maybe you've known someone who has entered the sex trade. Maybe you know a variety of people who've entered the sex trade. And if you ask them, how they got into it, it usually fits into one of those three C's, choice, circumstance, or coercion. So I'll give you an example. So on this end of the spectrum is choice. So I'm a sex worker. Every time I have sex with a client, it is in fact consensual sex, and there's some sort of exchange involved. Opposite, opposite, opposite end of the spectrum is I'm being forced, I'm being tricked, I'm being coerced, I've been given an ultimatum, I have been, you know, manipulated, exploited in some way. In fact, every time I have sex with a client, it is unconsensual sex. Coercion. Now the middle is where it's incredibly gray and incredibly murky and where people really struggle with the definition. And that's when people's situations are inherently exploitive, but no person is exploiting them. For example, mental health exploits people, poverty exploits people, addiction exploits people, but no person is exploiting you. So is this, and this is the circumstantial C, right? So is this situation human trafficking? No, it in fact cannot be, because if you go back to the definition, force, fraud, and coercion facilitated by a third person, you need that third person, you need an exploiter in order for human trafficking to exist. Does it mean that the person who's in the situation circumstantially doesn't need support? Of course not. But does it mean that they're being trafficked? No. Does that make sense? So that's really what most people misunderstand the definition of human trafficking to be. So force, fraud, and coercion facilitated by a third uh, person for the purposes of exploitation. That's the definition of human trafficking. Now, when it becomes coercive, it becomes human trafficking. Now, it's also really tricky because when we're talking about people with developmental disabilities or when you're talking about youth who are struggling with mental health issues or you're talking about vulnerable populations in general, you can move from one C to another C. So I'll give you an example. So I work with this young woman um, and she, uh, she got pregnant when she was in high school and she decided that she was going to drop out of school. She wanted to support her daughter um, and she began doing sex work independently um, because of her circumstances. She needed to raise money for her family. Now she met this guy who started off as being her client and he took incredibly good care of her. They started developing a personal relationship and he said, you know, we could really pump up this business, we could really do this together. And end of the story, basically, he then exploited her for what she was doing and took advantage of her and kept the majority of the money. So she started off in a situation that was sort of bordering between choice and circumstance and then she became trafficked. You can move the other way in the direction of the C's as well. So I'll give you another example. I worked with a client, supported her, she's full on trafficked, had a, a, a horrific situation where her trafficky identified, she identified her trafficker to be her boyfriend. This is a very common story. You'll hear it often. I'll be talking about it often. You might already be familiar with that sort of story. Um, and we supported her in, a, in a escaping. And she left him, and she was doing incredibly well. And she said, you know, I'm used to this form of trauma. I can stomach it. I'm going to do this on my own until I make $10,000. I just want to make back the money that I had made before. So she no longer has a trafficker. But because of her exploitation, she then is in a situation where she's doing circumstantial sex work because she was trafficked. So 
The reason I'm breaking down these C's is because we have to support our clients based on that C. If I said to this person, um, you know, if I treated them in a, in a way that was based in them being there by choice, that would be a completely ineffective strategy. And if I treated the person who was being there by choice and I said, you know, I am going to do everything in my power to get you out of there, don't worry, I'm going to protect, they're going to be, who, who are you talk, you're talking to me like that, right? So you have to really be mindful of where someone is at and how they identify and that you understand and you would demonstrate to them that you understand the difference of these positions um, so that you can support them in the best way possible. Does that make sense so far? Okay. So here are some police statistics, uh, just so you know what we're actually talking about in terms of you know how big this problem is in um, in in Toronto. So these stats are from there's a, a unit of the Toronto Police Services called the Human Enforcement uh, sorry Human Trafficking Enforcement Team, the Heat Team. And they shared with us some of their stats, and they told us between 2013 and 2014, they had a 113 percent increase in occurrences, a 360 percent increase in arrests, and a 4,000 percent increase in search warrants related to human trafficking um, for the purposes of sexual exploitation. Now, I think it's really important that we understand what the word domestic means. So. When you go to an airport, they're sort of, you know, they're, they're, you could fly domestically or you could fly internationally, right? And so when you're flying domestically means you are flying within the country that you're currently already in. And when you're flying internationally, it means you're leaving the country you're currently in to go to a different country. Same with the definition of human trafficking. So the trafficking that exists in Canada, although there is there is absolutely international human trafficking, the majority of the trafficking that exists here is domestic, which means you are from Canada and you are being trafficked within Canada. Um, and so the stats that the police shared with us are are the, the 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 domestic human trafficking stats. So that's not to say they don't see international cases, but the majority of the cases that they're seeing and that we're seeing um, in terms of an agency that specifically supports survivors of human trafficking are majority domestic human trafficking. So people who are trafficked within Canada, um, who who are who are either from Canada or the reason they came to Canada had nothing to do with their trafficking and then they were trafficked within it. So of those, so th you know, there's a, there, the current stats and the Canadian Women's Foundation did a ton of research and so they say that, the, that there are approximately 16,000 people currently being trafficked in Canada. And this is trafficking for all different reasons, including forced labor, domestic labor, um, uh, organ trafficking, sex trafficking, all you know, all the variety of, of kinds of trafficking. But the majority of the trafficking that exists is for sex, and the majority of the trafficking that exists is domestic. So of those 16,000 people currently being trafficked in Canada, and again, those numbers are probably vastly underreported because of how statistics are collected, and because so few people who are trafficked actually report to law enforcement, and law enforcement are one of the only, um, I guess, institutions that's collecting statistics, uh, we'll, we'll work with the number of 16,000 for now. They say that 71% of those trafficked um, are, are Canadian cases involving domestic sex trafficking that 90% of those 16,000 people being trafficked are female identified, and that 63% of those being trafficked are between the ages of 15 to 24 years old. Any questions so far? Okay. So what does it actually look like to be trafficked? Now, the cases that, that, that we support at East Metro, 100% of the cases identify that they are in some sort of relationship. I don't mean necessarily intimate relationship, but I mean some sort of relationship with their trafficker. So this could be 
friendship, it could be intimate relationship, or it could be familial relationship. Every single one of the cases that we've supported has some sort of relationship before being trafficked. So that is very important to know. Because, you know, if we think about the movie Taken again, that is, you know, the stranger who is breaking into her apartment, right? The stranger who she has no relationship, basically kidnapping her and, and trafficking her. Now, this exists. This I'm not saying that that you know, isn't a, uh, a, a story that could, we, we could possibly hear. It. it is, but it is not the story that we're hearing commonly. What we're hearing most commonly is that this is my friend, this is my partner, and this is my mom, my stepdad, my cousin, someone I have a relationship with. Now, the first thing that you need to do in order to traffic someone is you need to know who to traffic. And what you're looking for is vulnerability. You're assessing their vulnerability. So if all of us were in a, in a room with youth, or if, if we were in a room full of the clients you serve, in two seconds, you would have the ability to say, that person's the most vulnerable, that person's the most vulnerable, that person's the most vulnerable. We have that gift. That's why we do what we do, right? That's why we're in the agencies, the, 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 the field that we're in. That's why we work at these agencies. We have the ability to assess vulnerability, and we have the ability to then support people based on their vulnerabilities. Now, traffickers have the exact same skill set that we all have in this room, but they're using it in a different way. So they're assessing vulnerability, and then they're collecting as much information as possible. They're finding out what your hopes are, what your goals are, what you want for the future, who's important to you, who you have close relationships with. They're finding out what, what would be something that would be so incredibly special for you, what would make you feel like you had hit the jackpot, what would make you feel like I am that friend to you, that I am that relationship to you, that I am that person that totally, totally gets you. That is what they're doing. They're trying to find out as much as they can about you. They're making you feel incredibly loved. They're making you feel incredibly special. Now, the majority of the clients that we serve, they're identifying their trafficker to be their boyfriend. So I'm gonna talk about it a little bit that way. Um, but again, this whole stage of exploitation chart can be applied to any relational dynamic. So they've lured, and then the grooming and gaming, or what we call the honeymoon phase, sets in. They make you feel incredibly loved. They make you feel incredibly special. They make you feel like, you know, they could promise you the world that you know, get, getting your hair done, getting your nails done, taking you out for dinner, making you feel like you won the lottery with this person. Now, sometimes drugs and alcohol are used as a tactic of, of control. Um, at this point, in this honeymoon stage, they're used as whatever it is you're looking for, I'll hook you up. Or, oh, you've never tried this before? Come on, it's so fun. It, it's just this introduction. And then the mixed messages set in. So they're playing with your, you know, so they're doing things like, I really, really love you, you're really amazing, you make me feel so good, and then they pull away. And they make you feel amazing, they make you feel so good, and they make you feel like we're doing all these incredible things together, and then you, they pull away, and you're like, what did I do wrong? I'll do anything to make things go back to the way they were before. I'll do anything to get back into your good books. Like, it was before. And so, you know, they're withdrawing emotionally. They're really confusing you. Um, they're doing things like having sex with you and then immediately after taking you shopping, or having sex with you and then immediately after, you know, treating you to get your hair done or your nails done. Slowly that gets replaced with having sex with you and then giving you cash and saying, oh, baby, you made me feel so good. Go do something to treat yourself. Go shopping. Your brain starts associating sex with a reward, sex with money, 
And because you feel like you've done something wrong and you so badly want to get back into their good books, you might do things boundary-wise that you wouldn't have done before. This could be sexual, it could be not sexual. It could be that, you know, they wanted you to hold drugs for them. It could be that they you looked out while they robbed somebody. It could be that, you know, they've been begging you to take pictures of yourself or for them to take pictures of you and you really felt uncomfortable doing this, but you so badly wanted to go back to that honeymoon, <coughs> that love, that grooming, that gaming stage, that you'll do things that you might not have done before. This does a few things. Number one, it desensitizes you to certain different sexual acts. And number two, it makes, uh, makes you realize that they have a certain level of control over you based on the manipulation and exploitation they're using. And then the full-on exploitation sets in. They've broken your spirit. They have done things like, you know, it, I mean, it can look uh, in a lot of different ways. So it, it could look insidious and it could look really direct. So they could do things like, say things to you like, you know, I, I'm really struggling financially. You know, I just lost my job. I gotta support my mom. And I have this crazy idea, you're never gonna go for it. Never mind, like, just forget that I said anything. And you're like, no, what? Like, tell me, I'm listening. Um, and they're like, you know, and then they introduce the idea to you. That's very common. Um, sometimes they do things where they show you other people's back page ads. Back page is the, is the most common website where sex is advertised in, in Ontario. And so they'll show you someone else's ads and, you're, and they're gonna say, look how much money these girls are making. You're so much prettier than her. You could be making so much more money than her. Oh, if I was a girl, I would be doing this for sure. You're already having sex for free, so why wouldn't you just get paid to do it? Like, you're, you're already doing it anyway. Um, it's, it can be really direct in that they could threaten you. They can say, if you don't do this, I will send those naked pictures that we took to your family. I can post them on social media. I can out you to your job. I can out you to your parents, things like this. So we see a lot of different things. Now, we often think of this physical confinement when we're talking about human trafficking, that you're, you know, although if you Google human trafficking, go to Google image, there's tons of, of pictures of, of young women handcuffed or um, with a, a barcode over their mouths, or you know that they're in the fetal position on the floor, things like this. And again, physical <coughs> confinement and physical abuse can absolutely be a part of human trafficking. It often is, but it's used much more as a tactic to instill fear. Often our clients are not physically locked in a room Often they could leave the hotel room and go to the person uh, sitting in the lobby, but they aren't because they are terrified. And because of, you know, I, I describe it as it feels like there's a fence around your brain. The manipulation and exploitation is much more emotional and psychological than it is physical. 100% it can be physical. There are often pieces of that in, in, in many cases that we've supported. But much more we hear, I didn't leave because I was terrified of what would happen if I left. I was terrified of who they would tell. And mostly, the biggest one is who would ever love me again after this? So much of it is wrapped up in, in the shame and the stigma that you feel worthless. And that's partly because of how society responds to people in the sex trade and people who are trafficked. And so it's so important that we understand that we, we, when, when someone tells us this, that we do not judge them. 
that we don't think of them as less than or dirty or shameful or any of those things. Because so often the clients that, that we support that eventually feel comfortable making a disclosure to us say, I would never have told another social worker. Or I did tell another sh social worker and they were awful towards me. They made me feel judged more than my clients made me feel. They feel that this is like uh, the 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 worst possible thing that some that 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 someone could think of them. So they so want to hide it because of how we react. So we have to tailor our reaction so that they know number one we won't judge them, and number two that we will support them with whatever they need support with. I'm going to tell you a little story. I work with this the most incredible woman. She's a survivor of human trafficking, and. Um, she, she had two traffickers, and she was, she was staying in a hotel, and after she saw her first client, her trafficker came into her hotel room, he sat on, one of her traffickers sat on the bed beside her and said to her, I am so proud of you. And she said, oh, that's, that's, all, I, that's all I needed. That's all I needed to not leave. She said, they had learned in the luring stage that my parents had never told me in my life that they were proud of me for anything. So I didn't care what he was proud of me for. I didn't care who was proud of me. I would do anything to hear that again. That's really what domestic human trafficking looks like. Much more than the the trap, the taken or the handcuffed, uh, you know, in the back of a truck sort of situation. It is this emotional, psychological control. And it is always relational. Any questions? Okay. I don't think we have time to. Yeah. How do they, in the state, how do they find out? Good question. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question just so make sure everyone hears it. So, how do they know who to lure? Like, how do they collect know who to collect that information on? Is that is that right? I'm going to get there. I think it's the next slide. Yeah, I promise that we'll talk about the risk and vulnerability factors that people target. We don't have time to show you this movie, but you have it. Uh, if you click that link when you go home or the next, tomorrow at work. One of our, we have uh, people who have lived experience on our staff team. So Jade used to work at East Metro. She's now left East Metro because she wrote a book about um, her story. And, um, and she made this, this short video showing how she was brought through the four stages of exploitation. So I think it'd be really helpful. And in another example of, of demonstrating how someone was brought through those four stages. And you can check out her book. Um, <coughs> It's not the next slide, but it, it's, I think it's the one after this, so I promise. So a lot of people ask, well, how do people know how to traffic? How do people know how to uh, exploit people? How do people know how to bring someone through these stages or that you even need to bring someone through these stages? So this is really screwed up, but there are books and there are websites, there are blogs that teach people how to pimp. This is a quote from a book called Pimpology 101. It's available on Amazon. Anyone can buy it. I'll read you the quote. You'll start to dress her, think for her, own her. If you and your victim are sexually active, slow it down. After sex, take her shopping for one item. Hair in her nails is fine. She'll develop a feeling of accomplishment. The shopping after a month will be replaced by cash. The lovemaking turns into raw sex. She'll start to crave the intimacy and be willing to get back into your good graces. After you've broken her spirit, she has no sense of self-value. Now, Pim, put a price tag on that item you have manufactured. So you can see how, how this is taught. It's, te it, it, it's literally teaching someone to bring someone through those stages. Now, Traffickers have the identical risk factors as those they traffic. So that's really important for us to know. 
he, these or them. So when you're looking for somebody to traffic, or for us, when we're looking to support people who are possibly vulnerable to being trafficked, we need to understand the risk and vulnerability factors. So I, I break it down in, into two, uh, two groups. So first are the individual risk factors, such as low self-esteem, lack of self-worth, issues at home, issues with family, previous abuse, developmental disability. Um, if you have had struggles feeling inadequately loved or supported. Now, the other side of the circle are the systemic or the societal risk factors, which is being racialized, being indigenous, being a girl, being from the LGBTQ community, uh, being in a community that lacks socioeconomic resources, a community that has high levels of poverty, uh, if, you're, if your neighborhood is isolated um, or has you know, very few resources, um, if you were a newcomer. Now, if you could think about the people that you support and you could check off both individual and systemic risk factors, those people that have both, or where their circles overlap are at the highest risk of possibly being trafficked. Does that answer your question? No. Okay. So let me let me try to just take a stab at it. So when you're looking for when you're looking to traffic someone, you're looking for someone who has these things, right? So you're looking for someone who you know maybe is in, unfortunately, sometimes who accesses the same service agency that you do. Um, who goes to a similar group or who goes to the same school or who is living in the same form of housing. Um, and then you're looking to target someone who has these vulnerability factors because they will be, unfortunately, easier targets. So that's what you're looking for. Um, we can use this as a, a prevention method so we know who is most susceptible to being trafficked so we can equip them with the knowledge and the resources and the information to be able to protect themselves. Does that answer your question? Okay. Now, it's really important that we also understand that women are in the role of traffickers as well. Now, a lot of agencies won't work with people who are traffickers, who are women, uh, because they identify them as traffickers. Uh, how our agency sees it is most women who are in the position of being a trafficker are also being trafficked themselves. Trafficking has a very common hierarchy, which is when you want to be in the position of being the, like the real girlfriend. It's called like the wifey. It's also known as a bottom bitch, which sounds backwards, but the bottom bitch is like the top position of a, of a person you want to be if your trafficker has more than one person they're trafficking at once. Now, you want to be the person that they actually come home to at night, that they share a bed with when they sleep. You want to be the person that feels like this is actually a relationship. You know, that it's not only exploitive, that this person actually loves me. And, you know, the reason I'm in this is because he's told me one day we're going to have a house together. One day we're going to have a family together. One day we're going to have this life together. And because he's promised me these things, I see that there's a, a, a reason to stay because I've always wanted those things and I have not had an, any opportunity other than this person to get them. Because you want to believe that so badly and because maybe your options besides this are so few and far between, you stay and you stay in the position of so badly wanting to be that, that bottom bitch, that top girl. Now, sometimes in order to be in that position, they position it in a way for you to then do the recruiting. So sometimes it would be less scary to your clients who are young women if a woman approached them and said, look at all the money I have, look at this lifestyle I have, you could have this too. This is a very common way to be brought into the game. And the game is, um, I guess the, 
you know, the all-encompassing word that people use when, you know, they're not going to come into your office and be like, um, hi, I'm a survivor of human trafficking. I just wanted to, you know, tell you that. They're going to say, they're going to they're going to make disclosures in ways that we have to be attuned to picking up on by saying little things like, I'm in the game. And we'll talk about more of those after. So they put them in a position of bringing new girls in, recruiting. And it it's smart of the traffickers to do, number one, because the heat is off of them if they're getting someone else to do their dirty work for them. Um, number two, because it's an incredibly successful uh, luring tactic. And young, the young women who are being trafficked say yes for a few reasons. And it is not their fault. In fact, it makes perfect sense why they say yes to then recruiting other people even though they're being trafficked themselves. They say yes because if you were in a position where someone literally controlled what you ate, where you slept, who you had sex with, how many clients you saw, what services you provide, how much money you charged, and then you were given a little bit of power to be in this top position, you take it. That is survival, that is human nature. And the other reason is self-preservation. Um, and what I mean by that is, if you have to have sex with 10 people a day, for example, but if you bring in a new girl who's also making money, you only have to have sex with five people a day, who wouldn't do that? That's just survival. And so it's very, very, very common that these young women do not identify as being trafficked, but they do identify as being a recruiter. And so it's really important that we dissect with them why they got into it, how this happened, and support them in the same way we would support a survivor of human trafficking. This is not to say that there aren't women who are just traffickers and they're not being trafficked, but that is very, uh, very rare. When we see young women being trafficked, the majority of the cases involve them, um, sorry, when they're traffickers, involve them being trafficked as well. Any questions about, yeah? Actually, my question was, how does one become a trafficker? So, the psyche of a trafficker. yeah, that's a really good question. Um, how does one become a trafficker? So, same vulnerabilities and risk factors that we talked about for young people who are being trafficked. Um, in some parts of Canada, it is an, an intergenerational knowledge that's passed on from father to son, from uncle to nephew, from friend to friend. Um, and then most of it is because of lack of opportunity, um, feeling like they don't have other options in terms of a life for themselves what, that will lead them to what their financial and power and control hopes and dreams are. Um, and some of them is because they have a criminal mind and that, you know, they uh, they don't mind exploiting someone in order to make a life for themselves. Um, it, it totally depends. Organized crime is often uh, also involved. Um, a, a variety, a variety of reasons. Um, the, cl the clients that I support, their traffickers are, are usually also young people who are quite suave, who are quite charming, who are quite charismatic, and they have been groomed by older guys in their neighborhood to be pimps. Um, I don't know, Wendy, do you want to add anything to that about the, you know, okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so I, that, that, oh. there we go, um, it, it totally depends, but I would say it's, it's based on their own vulnerabilities and risk factors and, um, and, and it, you know, and then you could also look at it in terms of like how the, the media sort of glamorizes this hyper masculinity of men and music videos and saw, you know, it's, it's, it's not seen as something that is a disturbing thing to do to women. It's seen as a, a way to make money, and that's incredibly problematic. It's gender, what we're talking about is gender-based violence, 
right? It's not a, not prettier than that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I was also wondering if it's some, some, some traffickers may have been victims themselves, like young men who were trafficked in some way and then they got out of it and became you know, trafficked themselves. That's totally possible. That's not a, a situation I hear about frequently, but I wouldn't rule it out completely. Yeah, sure. Any other questions? So I mentioned that there's a whole language and vocabulary of the game um, of being trafficked. And again, no one is coming into your office and saying, you know, I'm being commercially sexually exploited. Um, they're going to disclose things to you in a way that they hope you pick up on because they're more comfortable making a disclosure um, and hope and 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 hoping that you know what they're saying so they don't have to full on say that so the game is a very common way for our our clients to sort of drop drop hints at us that they're involved in something like this um, this is the postcard of the, the flyer for our program at East Metro um, it, and if you are not in the game and you read this, you're like, I have no idea what this is saying. Like, you have no idea what we're talking about. So it's sort of like, um, uh, I guess, like a a way for us to know if someone, you know, if if they if they are responsive to this card, we have a better, a much better understanding that they're probably involved in this. Um, anyone know what "be my rider" means or "ride or die"? I'm sure you hear these words all the time. Anyone know what that means? So it's like the ultimate form of commitment. Like no matter what happens, I'm going to stay with you. Even if you do something awful to me, even if you go to jail, I'm gonna wait it out with you. This is a very common word that we hear our clients using. Thought, does anyone know what a thought is? It's an acronym. You know what it means? I won't make you say it. It stands for that hoe over there. It's very, and this is a derivative of the sex trade, but if someone is using this word, it doesn't mean they're in the sex trade. But again, part of the, the vocabulary of this. Um, telly, do you ever hear the clients you're serving saying, we're going to hang out at the telly? It's a slang for hotel. No one says hotel anymore, like no one. And so, and if you hear someone saying you're a telly ting, it's like, thing is thing, slang for thing, so it just means hotel thing, which means they're accusing you of being in the sex trade. So, sounds so silly, but if you hear these words, it's an in to have a conversation that you might have not known to have before. And I always say that if, you know, my clients speak French, well, I better learn French. So it's, it's, you know, it's not that you need to learn every one of these words, but it, it is to mean that if you hear a client saying something that you don't know what it means, that you put your ego aside and you say, what? What, what, was, what? Teach me what that means. Like, I have no idea what you just said. Teach me what that means, please. Um, this does a few things. Any chance we can to lessen the power dynamic between our clients and ourselves, we should take. And our clients love teaching us things. They love an opportunity for when we don't know something and they do. So language is a very simple way of empowering them to teach us something. Um, if, you, if you Google glossary of human trafficking, you will find hundreds of words. So you can, like, simple Google, you'll find hundreds and hundreds of words that, again, you don't have to memorize the definitions to, but it might be really interesting and important for you to understand that there is a whole language and vocabulary of this lifestyle that, in fact, helps us identify who is possibly being recruited, who's possibly in the game already. Uh, so language is one warning sign but there are some other ones that are it's really important for us to recognize so we often think of people in the sex trade looking a stereotypical way you know this excessive primping with the long hair and the nails and the makeup and the outfits and the purses and some people look the stereotypical way and and often you don't what we're looking for instead of this you know one way that we assume everyone in the sex trade looks 
is that we're looking for unexplained money, unexplained clothes, unexplained things that they're spending money on that they wouldn't have access to unless something was going on. Um, again, those are ins to have conversations. So you're not going to be like, I know you don't have a job, or I know your ODSP check doesn't cover you for this. Like, you're not going to accuse them of things, but you're going to be like, I really love your purse. Tell, like, where did you get it? Tell me everything about it. Little things like that are ins to have conversations that don't necessarily make somebody defensive, but allow us, uh, uh, we want our clients to know, to know we notice, but we don't want them to feel like they have to be defensive when we notice. Um, sides of trauma or abuse, SDIs, pregnancy, again, these are not, just because you have these things does not mean you're being trafficked, but we're looking at them as a whole instead of, you know, a checklist. Um, if you seem disoriented or isolated from the outside world, or if you were hanging out with one group of friends and then all of a sudden you're hanging out with another group of friends, or you're hanging out with one group of friends and all of a sudden you're not hanging out with them at all anymore, that could be a sign. If you're being very secret, secretive, if you're being very protective of your privacy, um, signs of controlling and abusive relationships, if you're always being accompanied by someone, this is a very, very common one. Oh, my boyfriend's waiting outside, or can I bring my friend to my doctor's appointment, or, you know, I have somebody who drives me somewhere, he, you know, he, she drives me all the way, she, he, he's just waiting outside. These are very, very common warning signs. Um, if you don't have your identification, so, I mean, when we're talking about domestic human trafficking, we're not talking about passports necessarily, but we're talking about someone else holding your health card, someone else holding your metro pass, things like this are very common signs. Um, and things like having two phones, also very common. Do you, does anyone have clients in the room whose phone number changes all the time? You do. Okay, that is like the probably the most obvious warning sign. Again, it could be just that their phones are turning off because of other situations and they have to get new numbers. But much more commonly what we see is that when you Google their phone number, their back page ad comes up. So they change their number constantly in order to not be outed, in order to not be stigmatized that, that they're possibly in the game. How am I for time? Okay. Okay, cool. um, the biggest warning sign, or the bi biggest risk factor of being trafficked is previous relational trauma. So trauma that was endured because of your caregivers or because your caregivers were unable to protect you from some sort of neglect or abuse. Now, this is not to say that if you've experienced relational trauma, you're going to be trafficked. I don't mean it like that at all. But the majority of the clients that we support have experienced previous relational trauma, also known as developmental trauma. Now, the part of our brain that develops absolutely first is our brain stem. And that part of our brain is you know, it's sort of like our fight or flight part of our brain, right? So it does things like regulates our heartbeat, it tells us to breathe, it regulates our body temperature, um, it helps us sleep, things like that. The part of our brain that develops second from last is our limbic system. And our limbic system is the part of our brain that teaches us how to emotionally regulate, teaches us when it's appropriate to feel a certain emotion and then act on that certain emotion. And then the part of our brain that develops absolutely last is our cortex. And our cortex is the part of the brain that helps us with higher level decisions, decision making. It helps us with um, concrete and abstract thought. Now, if you are a young person, who's experienced developmental trauma specifically from zero to three because 90% of our brains develop before we're three years old. Now, 
That means that maybe your limbic system and your cortex are not developed to the full extent they could have been developed if you did not experience relational trauma. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean you don't have those parts of the brain. It doesn't mean those parts of your brain are not working. But it does mean it's possible that your limbic system, your ability to emotionally regulate, and your cortex, your ability to make higher level decisions are not as developed as they could have been if you did not experience relational trauma. This is not to blame people for being trafficked to experience relational trauma. I'll get to why we're talking about it. There are ingredients that make for a healthy brain. Consistency in our environments, enrichment, predictability, um, nurturance, very, very important for our, our brain to have all of these ingredients in order to be its fully developed self. If you think about your brain as the foundation of a building, and you think about, you know, a one that had, you know, F, you know, a healthy brain would be like, you know, everyone at the, the job site when this building was getting built, they showed up on time, the construction materials were delivered early, everyone worked beautifully, collaboratively together to get this building built. They build this building, you throw something at it, it is so incredibly strong, it is so incredibly resilient, very little can happen to it. Even if it does, the foundation of the building is, is together. Now, the opposite is also true. If you think about your brain as the foundation of a building where there are threats or inconsistency or instability, that is our brain, how our brain interprets trauma. And so you think about your brain as the foundation of a building. You know, some people showed up on time, some people were late for the job site. The building, you know, materials, some of them got delivered, some of them were late, some of them were missing altogether. The building got built. The foundation, it, it, it got built. But if you throw something at the foundation, it is not as resilient as the first foundation. So why am I telling you this? Why are we talking about this? Because if you think about the people that you support, and you think about our basic needs, so it is our caregiver's jobs to make sure that all of our needs are being met. It is our caregiver's job to make sure that we have a roof over our heads, food in our bellies, clothes on our back. It is our caregiver's job to make us feel safe, supported, secure, protected. It is our caregiver's job to boost our self-esteem and to make us feel loved, to make us feel unconditionally supported. And it's our caregiver's job to one day teach us how to be self-sufficient, adults. Now, connecting it all back to the brain, if for whatever reason your caregivers, for, for whatever reason, were unable to meet all of those needs, maybe it was relational trauma, maybe it was a lack of resources, maybe your caregivers themselves also suffered from relational trauma, who knows, it doesn't matter. But if for whatever reason your caregivers were unable to meet all of your needs, and a trafficker came along and said, oh, you know, we're gonna live in a hotel, we're gonna have, we're gonna order Uber Eats and have pizza every day for our meals, it's gonna be great. I am gonna keep you safe, secure, protected. I won't let anything bad happen to you. You are my ride or die. You are my girl. I am going to make you feel so incredibly loved and supported and I am going to do everything in my power to boost your self-esteem. If you didn't have this at home and somebody offered this to you, who would say no? I know I wouldn't. It is in fact survival to make sure that our basic needs are being met when they are not. And the people that they are targeting for trafficking are the people whose basic needs are not being met by the people who are supposed to meet them. If you take one thing from today's presentation, I hope it's this. That is, in fact, unfair to ask somebody to leave their trafficking situation unless you have found replacement ways to meet every single one of these needs. If you ask somebody to leave before doing that, what will happen? They, they go back. 
that is the biggest, biggest problem with human trafficking supports, is that they come from a place of wanting to save and rescue. They come from a place of saying, oh my God, that's so horrific, let's get you out of there immediately, which is so well-intentioned. Of course that's what you want to do, of course. Of course, it makes perfect sense to want to pick someone up and get them out of there as fast as we possibly can. Sometimes that is, in fact, in fact, more dangerous. What we need to do first is find replacement ways to make sure they are housed, to make sure that they have uh, you know, access to OW, ODSP, whatever sort of financial supports we can access to make sure that we reconnect them with safe, supportive, loving people, to make sure that we safety plan, to make sure that we have everything in place should this person ever contact them again, to in fact love our clients but with boundaries, and to make sure that we connect them to people and we do this ourselves to boost their self-esteem. If we cannot do these things, we are setting them up for fa failure, they'll go back. They will go back, and they'll go back again because it is survival to get your basic needs met. It is not their fault that they possibly have relational trauma. It is not their fault that they possibly did not have their basic needs met before. Some people challenge me and say, not everyone who's trafficked fits into this. That is totally true. But the majority of the clients that we serve are not getting their basic met needs met fully by the people who are supposed to meet them. That is really the majority of the people who are trafficked. Does that make sense? Okay, so what do we do? How do we intervene? Let's make a model. So is everyone familiar with the stages of change model? I'll explain it in like a, a super two second way for those who are not familiar and then we'll apply human trafficking to the model. Okay, so how many people are coffee drinkers in this room? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, how many people are the kind of coffee drinkers that are like, I love coffee, it's the best thing that has ever happened to me. I will never stop drinking coffee. I love it, I love it, I love it, I love it. Okay, so you are the kind of people that we would call in a stages of change model as pre-contemplative. You are not even contemplating changing your behavior. <laughs> Right? There's no reason, you don't even recognize that there's anything to change. It's great, why would I change it? Okay, how many people are, are the kind of coffee drinkers that are like, I love coffee, it helps me every morning, it's so great, but like maybe I would consider like reducing the amount of coffee I drink. I guess it's not so good for me. How many people are there? Okay, so you, in the stages of change model, we would call you contemplative. So you're recognizing that there's like maybe something that's not totally perfect with your behavior, but you're not really like at a stage where you're ready to change the behavior. But there's a glimpse of, of, of recognition. Okay, so how many people are, are, are at the stage where they're like, yeah, I guess I should stop drinking coffee. I get, you know, like you're, you're ready to just, Bite the bullet and give it a try. You're, you haven't done it yet, but you're at that place where you're like, okay, I could consider actually doing this. Is anybody there? Okay, great. We would call you at the preparation stage. Okay, how many people are, are used to be coffee drinkers? They just stopped drinking coffee. You know, when they walk by Starbucks and they smell the beans, it's like really tempting to not go in, but they're, they're working on not drinking coffee. Great, so you would be at the action stage of, of quitting coffee drinking. How many people used to be coffee drinkers, don't have any coffee anymore, sometimes, once in a while, get a temptation, but you resist? Great, so you're at the maintenance stage of coffee drinking. Let's apply this to human trafficking. <coughs> if someone is pre-contemplative, so I'll give you an example. I get a call from a mom and the mom says to me, Carly, I found my daughter's back page ad. She disappears every single weekend. In her room, I found hotel key cards. I know for sure, without a doubt in my mind, she's being trafficked. You gotta talk to her. Okay, no problem, bring her in, I'll meet her tomorrow. I meet her, tomorrow, I meet her the next day and she says, I don't know what my mom told you, I'm in a relationship, I've never been happier in my life. He doesn't make me do anything I don't wanna do. I can totally leave anytime I want it. I don't know what she said to you. You cannot listen to her. And I said, and I would say to her, imagine I said this to her, imagine I said to her, 
don't worry, your mom, she told me everything. I, I know, like, don't worry, I, I know really what's going on, and I'm gonna make you an exit strategy, and we're gonna get you out of there, and you never have to see him again in your life. What's that person gonna say to me? Well, do you want me to be alive? Please. <laughs> F you. Fuck off. They're gonna. They're. They're not gonna be. You, you, you have not engaged them at all, right? You. You have not met them where they are at all. You've done the opposite. Now that young person is she going to eventually tell you when she wants out? If you've reacted that way to her, no. Now as much as we intend that that you know the, the getting someone out is is, is of course like. At our deepest level, that's all we want for this person. We can't stomach that this is happening to them. But in order to engage them, in order to support them, in order to move them to the next stage of change, we have to, at this point, when someone is pre-contemplative, we have to equip them with every strategy in our tool belt to do whatever it is they're doing as safely as possible. There's the most incredible resource. It's called livingincommunity.ca. And um, it's like a, a list of strategies of harm reduction tools for someone who's currently in the sex trade to equip them with in order to do whatever it is they're doing as safely as possible. Does this mean I'm not gonna continue having conversations to move them to the next stage of change? No, of course not. Does this mean we're not going to talk about, you know, the, the bad part of the relationship? No, of course not. But it also means that I'm not going to judge her for what she's currently doing, and I'm not going to rescue her when she doesn't want to be rescued. Okay, someone is contemplative. So they're saying things to you like, yeah, he's, you know, he's really great. Like sometimes he makes me do things that I don't want to do, but like he's really great. I'm sure you all have clients, you know, who say who are sort of contemplating between um, is this good, is this bad. So what we want to do in this stage is we want to explore both the pros and cons of the situation. We want to dissect um, what is good about the situation because we want to understand what needs the relationship is in fact meeting. When we think about it like that, it, it challenges our clients to think about their relationship in a, in a, a bigger picture way. So you can even show them a, a simplified version of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and say, tell me how your relationship is meeting your needs. I, I want to get how it's meeting your physiological needs. I want to get how it's meeting your safety needs. I want to get how it's meeting your love and belonging needs. I want to get how it's meeting your self-esteem needs. I want to get it. And then this gives them an exercise to really dissect the relationship. And you want to do things like, um, you know, so often when people have pros and cons of a situation, we really empathize with the cons, right? Because we really want to pump up what's bad about the situation and really minimize what's good about the situation. Like, I'm thinking about a, a personal relationship I have with one of my friends, and she's in this relationship, and she's like, oh, my boyfriend is the worst, he's so unreliable, he cancels plans all the time with me, and like, blah, on and on and on. And I say to her, like, what are you doing with this guy? You're such a catch, you're so smart, you're so funny, like, why are you wasting your time? And she says, no, Carly, you don't get it. She says, he's really great when we are together. And she becomes defensive of the part she thinks I didn't hear. Clients do the same thing. When we only empathize with what's bad, they become defensive of the parts that are good. It, in fact, does the opposite of what we intended to do. So we have to both empathize with the pros and the cons. So I would say to this person, I get it. It is, you, you know, it is a shitty situation. You in your lifetime never thought that you would be where you are today. You never thought that you were gonna have to be doing this. You never in your lifetime thought that you would have to do this and that this was part of your what you'd have to come to talk to me about. But on the other hand, you are terrified that if you leave him, your life is gonna be even worse than it is now. If you leave him, you're scared that no one is going to love you again. And so as long as you do that, as long as you get them to realize that you get the struggle, that you get the pull and push of staying versus leaving, then you have created a relationship with them where then they can 
they can then have space and room to talk about both the good and bad. And then you can move them to the next stage because they think, oh, you get it. You get the struggle of staying versus leaving. If someone is at the preparation stage, so they're ready, um, they're like, okay, I think I can do this. I think I can leave. Um, at this point, you're going to, in fact, show them the cycle of exploitation, the, the stair chart we looked at at the beginning, and you're going to say, check off all the things that, that you've been through. Check off all the things that have happened to you in this. And you do this for a few reasons. The number one reason you do this is because they're like, holy crap, I thought I was the only person on the planet that this has happened to. I can't believe there's a whole chart for exactly what I've experienced. I'll go back to it for a sec. Um, oops. And then the, the more important reason is you have to connect the exploitation to the good parts of the relationship. Because they stay in these relationships because they think, if only I make this much more money, if only I have sex with this many more people, if only I do these things that he's been dying for me to do, if only we make enough money that we buy that car or we put a down payment on that condo by the lake shore that we have been talking about this whole time, then maybe he'll be good to me again. I know he's capable of taking incredibly good care of me. So if only I am nice to him, if only I do these things, maybe he'll go back to treating me well again. You use this chart to explain to them that in fact them being good to you is how they exploited you. They needed to do that in order to gain your trust, in order to exploit you. And so you can use this to make those connections. Uh, someone is at the action stage, so they have left. They're newly out of the game. Then you're going to hook them up with people who can process what they've been through, who can deal with the trauma, who can, you know, do some narrative work, who can, you know, uh, start to dissect the attachments, uh, and then plan for their preferred change. So if you try to put concrete things in place while someone is still in it, it's often, or, or you, you know, you assign uh, assign someone a therapist while they're still in it. It's like I always explain it like it's like sending a kid to kindergarten on an empty stomach. How really do you expect them to learn if all they're thinking about is, well, what am I going to have for lunch, right? Like it's it's in fact unfair. So you, when someone is so traumatized or someone is so you know they're yeah they're they're so incredibly aroused hyper aroused or hypo aroused and you send them to process their trauma but while they're still experiencing their trauma it often they're often not ready the only thing that you can do while they're still in it is hook them up with someone so they can start developing a relationship that piece is vital once they're out then the trauma work can begin when you leave and you're out the work is not over. You have to process the temptation to return and the strength it took in leaving. And only at this point can you actually do concrete goal planning. I'll give you another example. I have a client and she has been missing, I support her mom because she's been missing for two years. Um, but she calls her mom on a burner phone once a month. So her mom talks to her but has no idea where she is. And I say, what do you say to your daughter? You have her for 10 minutes on the phone. What do you say to her? And she says, you know, I say to her, if you come home, your life could be so much better. You could go back to school. You have one credit left. I'll help you get it done. Your life, you know, then you could get a job. You could. And I'm like, oh, that's like the opposite thing you should be saying to this kid. You should be saying to this kid, I don't care about what you are doing. You don't need to tell me a thing. All I care about is that you're safe. I love you, I love you, I love you, come home. That is it. Now, once she you know, has a trauma therapist, she's dissected a little bit of what's going on, she processed maybe some of the relational trauma, then you can say, hey, I hear you have one school credit left. Did you want to do it? Up to you. Any chance you can to impose your goals on someone else, it always backfires. Everything has to be our client's choice. And just because we think that's best for them, because you know we think automatically, oh, she's a young person, she's got to finish school, 
This person is so incredibly unsafe. We have no idea where she is. Our only, only goal for this young person is that she is okay, that she comes home, and that we like, cover her, hug her, coat her in love, and that is it. That is it, and no judgment. So often we hear parents who say to their kids, you're gonna end up on the street. You're such a slut. Da, 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 da. You gotta go. You know, and they and they they're actually blaming their the the people who are being trafficked. And if only they understood that this is in fact a a form of modern day slavery. Can you imagine blaming someone for that? That's how you have to think about this. This is the. Uh, uh, a photograph of the website I told you about, livingincommunity.ca, just so you know. So you go to the toolkit, and you can click on all of these different these circles. They're all different links. There's one for tool for sex workers, tool for understanding sexual exploitation, tool for schools and families, tools for customers. It's incredible. I always get the question, how do we combat this? You know, like big picture wise, how do we combat this? And my answer is always consent. We have to teach people about consent and not the kind of consent we learn about in school that is just like a, wa a whitewashed version of it, which is that yes means yes and no means no. That's just really not the definition of what consent actually is. It's incredibly nuanced. It's incredibly uh, hard to understand. We need to equip babies with the, with the concept of consent. We should start teaching this in kindergarten. Um, and it doesn't have to be about sex. There are very simple ways that we can teach consent that have nothing to do with sex. We need, uh, you know, you could do things like bring in hula hoops to, to kindergarten classes and say, this is my personal space. Who would you want to invite into your hula hoop? What would they need to ask you before they came into your hula hoop? What if someone came into your hula hoop and you wanted them out of your hula hoop? Like simple, basic, basic things that we need to do in order to equip people with the understanding of consent. There are four elements that I, I, I like to tell everyone so that you then tell everyone, it's your job now to tell 10 people, like one of those chain emails that you get about the four elements of consent. We have to spread the word about what it actually is, what it actually looks like. It has to be clear. It, you need to, um, it needs to be active. So you, let's say you, um, how do I explain this? You need to, be able to understand what the person's saying. So either through body language or through language, it has to be clear but on both parts. You have to know what you are consenting to. It has to be ongoing. So let's say you consent to one, some, one thing one day, the next day you have to consent to the same thing again. It has to be willing. Um, it can never be given under pressure. So this is the human trafficking problem with the consent because all of my clients say to me, um, but I said yes. And they think, oh, that means they've consented. But when someone has said, you know, we could have this life together, we're gonna have this family, we're gonna make this money, all of these things, when they've promised something to you or they've threatened you with something and then you say yes, it in fact cancels out the yes. It is not willing consent. It has to be coherent. You cannot give consent if you are drunk. You cannot give consent if you are high. You cannot give consent if you are sleeping. You cannot give consent um, if you're incapacitated in any, any way. So those are the four elements of consent. And, and I think it's our job to equip every single client we work with with actually understanding what this means. This I believe is the one tool that could combat human trafficking. There's the most incredible video, the YouTube link is there again for you to watch when you get home. Um, have, you, have you guys seen the tea consent video? Most people have seen this video. It uses drinking a cup of tea as an example of, of teaching consent. I think that one's good, but I think there's one that's better. And it's called, the Western University made one and it's about bike riding. 
And I think it's the most incredible tool to teach young people about consent, or people with developmental disabilities, I think would be an incredibly effective tool. And it talks about, um, it uses bike riding as an example of, of uh, if you've consented to do it with someone. It's very funny and very cute, and I, I definitely recommend you, you checking it out. If there's anything cool about trauma, <laughs> Um, it's that our brain has the capacity to heal. That our limbic systems and our cortexes have the capacity to continue to develop. And this happens through relationship. So when trauma is endured through relationship, the only way to fix it is through relationship. And so there is a ton of evidence that proves that healthy, supportive, nurturing relationships literally help your brain reheal and grow. And that's what our program seeks to do. We do psychoeducation about the cycle of exploitation and about equipping people to understand their vulnerabilities. A lot of programs are strength-based, which is of course very important, but we sometimes shy away from equipping our clients to understand their own vulnerabilities. I think that is necessary that they understand their own vulnerabilities so they can understand how other people might take advantage of their vulnerabilities. We restabilize their body to their brain. So, so often when people have been traumatized, specifically when it has to do with a sexual trauma, you dissociate between your brain and your body. So we do a lot of work to teach people to listen to their guts, to teach people that you know their stomach is the siren of danger. So how do we learn to tune in and listen to it? Um, we rebuild self-esteem. We do our best to remove the shame and blame. Um, we try to lessen trauma symptoms, and we're doing this by creating and rebuilding a healthy, supportive, nurturing environment uh, and relationship. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Hello. Could, sorry. Oops. I have mics here, so I want to be able to hear, because I forgot to tell you we're filming. Oops. I'll just ask you. Uh, just now, yeah. I just got it. Thanks. Uh, can I go ahead? Oh. Can this uh, be emailed to us? The copy that we have is missing a bunch of slides. Oh. Yes. Yeah, I, I would appreciate if you just put some sort of way for it not to be altered when you send it out, just yeah. because so often some. I'm not saying that you're going to do this, but some people go to a presentation and then they think they can give the presentation. So it could be draft or, or something on it. Absolutely. So, but absolutely, you can have access. We'll do whatever you say. Cool. <laughs> we can also make it a PDF so that you yeah. can't make changes. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Jen. How long is what? Oh yeah. Sorry. Jen, stand up. How long do the relationships continue? the trafficker what's the typical it's a really good question so okay if you go to the stage if you go to the stages of exploitation so I have clients that this whole process has taken hours I have clients that this whole process has taken days and I have clients where this whole process has taken months it depends how, how vulnerable the young person is or the, the person that they're trafficking is or they're attempting to traffic is it also has it depends on how how experience the trafficker is um, and some tr people stay with their traffickers for years um, and some stay with their traffickers you know the, the story I told you of, of the young woman whose trafficker came onto her bed and said how proud he was that she was only she was trafficking I say only it's like not that that's any less awful for two weeks but the trauma was significant so so it, it really depends on so many factors um, it depends I would say it mostly defend, depends on how vulnerable you are and how supported you are so what connections do you have to the community what relationship do you have with your family um, are people looking for you all of those things are, are, are huge factors in getting out my question was, how long will a trafficker work on getting someone trafficked? And how long will the, this weird, this sick relationship continue on? Like, that's until the person is. I see. I see. I see. Like that, that you you up. become much less valuable the older you get. Um, 
you usually get dropped, like that they're no longer interested in you, they're, they're trafficking some other people. You, you know, our uh, the clients that we support, we, we support people up to 29, um, and we have, we have, you know, we sometimes get phone calls, I'm 31 and I just got out, but that's, that's much rarer, because you don't make as much money in the sex market. You become less valuable in the sex market. Um, so, and sometimes you're, you're, they continue to traffic you until your until your 30s or 40s if you have no way of getting out. It, it totally, totally depends on your resilience and your uh, connection to resources and how valuable you are to them and how savvy they are in trafficking. Mm -hmm. Hi, Carly. Hi. Uh, thank you for all the information. You mentioned earlier that women tend to recruit other younger women possibly yes uh, with the intention of seeing less clients yes how likely is that because from a business perspective <laughs> not <laughs> maybe maybe for the first two weeks right like maybe there's some sort of reward you brought her in you're my girl you, you know, he sleeps in your hotel room that night because he wants you to continue to do it, right? So there has to be the illusion of a reward, right? Um, but uh, you're, you're so right that it changes incredibly quickly, right? And then you brought in another girl, you so badly don't want her to be the top girl because she's the new girl, right? Um, which means she likely hasn't had sex with as many people, which makes her more desirable to her trafficker um, and to new clients because she's, right? You get all that. So you, you might see more, just as many clients right away because you don't want her to take the position of the bottom bitch because you're now threatened. Hi, Kelly. Hi. Yeah, uh, this training seems to center more on the female, on women. Mm -hmm. uh, how about the male? Good question. How much of it is that? Sure. So, 90% of the people who are domestically trafficked in Canada are female identified. Um, but that's not to say young men are not trafficked. And the majority of young men that are trafficked are part of the LGBTQ community. And that they're being trafficked often because they're not being supported or accepted by their families. And that they're kicked out of the home. And that they're in a position of vulnerability. And they're trafficked in the identical way. So the stages of exploitation can absolutely be applied. Um, and a lot of our clients are, are trans women. Um, so I should mention that as well. So very, very good question. So you can apply it, um, but I would say the majority of young men who are being trafficked identify as, as uh, in the, on the LGBTQ uh, continuum. Mm -hmm. uh, hi. So for sex workers who are doing this for years or in the pre contemplation stage for years, how do we ensure the protection during those years? Canada's laws like protecting sex workers. So sex workers, sex workers and survivors of human trafficking are totally different populations. So are we talking about, do you mean people who are doing choice or circumstantial sex work who are not being trafficked? Or do you mean people who are being trafficked but are, are pre-contemplative? I think both. Tra being trafficked and being pre-contemplative, I think it goes back and forth. Push and pull, right? So ensuring how we can them. Okay, so I would say those are two very different populations and the way we would address them are very different. So if you're a sex worker and you're doing circumstantial sex work or sex work by choice, that means there's no third party present in keeping you there. It could mean that your poverty is keeping there, your mental health is keeping there, your addiction is keeping there. There's something, something that makes you um, vulnerable is exploiting you even though no person is exploiting you. Um, so. If that's your case, if that's the case, if those are the clients you're supporting, I would use a full harm reduction strategy. How can you help them do whatever it is they're doing as safely as possible? And then how can you help them get resources in place so that it's no longer situational, right? So if you have resources in place like housing, supportive housing, um, if you have resources in place where they have financial means besides having to do sex work to survive, um, then it's no longer situational or circumstantial, and then you can use harm reduction and then actually use supportive resources to get them out, right? If somebody is at a place where they're pre-contemplative, which means they're being trafficked, but they're recognizing that it's not trafficking, right? So at that 
that place, you are going to do everything in your power to make sure that they know that you're not judging them, that you're supporting them, and that you're going to have conversations with them. You're going to use the stages of change model to try to move them to a place of contemplation instead of pre-contemplation. You're not going to move them to a place where you want them to get out that minute, but you're going to slowly have conversations that, by using that model, which I wish I had more time to get into the tactics of that model, to try to move someone along the continuum of a stage of change, and you're going to be employing the harm reduction strategies at the same time that you would do with the other population. Does that make sense? No, it does. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Anyone else have questions? Carly, can you stay back for a couple minutes during break and chit chat with people? Sure. Dan, I just want to say as well that there's lots of conversations going on about this and about how to bring it into the DS population and get a better. I mean, Karen Chan quoted, I think, 30%, excuse me, of the women who are trafficked, have a developmental disability. I was talking to Karen from the Provincial um, Human Trafficking Office. I don't think that's a clear um, number. Like, I think that's, it's hard to know exactly how many, but I think there's lots of people within developmental services who are really interested in engaging and having more of a conversation and looking at creating curriculum and, and that kind of thing. So I hope that you'll see more opportunities for collaboration and for engagement around conversations. I know through the Community Networks of Specialized Care, uh, my colleague in Central West for the Peel Collaborative over there um, contacted me this, me this morning asking about how can we look at, like they've got people in Central West interested in putting together awesome. curriculum. Awesome. So I think it's bringing people together like you, Carly, like Karen, like other people that are invested and interested in, in looking at how do we break this down even more so it's even more relatable to the people that we support. Totally. Um, yeah, so hopefully we can bring you into some That's of the discussions awesome. with your knowledge. Yeah. yeah, I think that'd be great. So just also add, um, this has creeped into a lot of the world of the relationship group that I've been teaching. I've worked with a lot of people. Hello? Did anyone have this on? Um, I've actually worked with a few folks who have developed facilities who've been human trafficked. Um, worked with some staff and used some resources uh, like Carly's. Uh, it's really complex and it's really challenging to work with the folks. I've heard stories of group home staff um, picking out folks in their group homes. Um, I've heard, yeah, I've read lots of stories. It's happening in our sector, and we need to be aware of it. We need to ask more questions. Um, and, yeah, to, to chat, because I think we need to do more work in the sector to educate our staff, especially group homes and programs, around this is, this is happening. Um, so please connect with me if you have any questions, and we can keep this educational road going, okay? And I just want to say thank you, Carly, on behalf of Sherwood Forum. This was amazing.